guys, it's May 8th, 2018, and this is your episode 144 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are Laurel Black. Hi. And Megan Arns. Hello. Megan, who's with you there? I've got Ryan Patterson with me. He's almost my former student. He's graduating with his master's degree here in about a week. And we're going to Ghana to celebrate with the other grad students uh, to study uh, there for three weeks. And he's attending UT Austin to start his DMA next year. And he's also a former student of our guests. So I thought it was very fitting to have him on today. So I want to say something else. Special thanks to Megan. She has finished what we, what YouTube calls time stamps. So on our podcast, what we have is we've got, you know, the hour or so duration and, you know, at zero seconds, we do the introduction and then five minutes in, we ask the guest a question and then 10 minutes in, for example, Ben does a topic or I do a topic and I've started time stamping as I've been editing, I don't know, maybe 50 episodes ago or something, but we decided, oh, it would be a really good idea to organize the information with these timestamps. So on our Blogspot page and on the YouTube page, all you listeners, you can find each episode categorized by topic. So if you want Ben's, all Ben's historical segments, you can just, you can go straight to them in every episode. If you just want Laurel segments, you can find them, et cetera. So happy to announce that the uh, yeah, timestamps are totally complete. And yeah, Ben just texted in the chat that he did like, oh, two of them. So good job, Ben. Thanks for- <laughs> Thanks. <sorry. laughs> <laughs> Have that's, 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 dissertations using our podcast. <laughs> yeah, so that's uh, that's Ben Charles, everybody. So, since, but it was uh, really interesting going back and listening to some of these earlier episodes. I mean, the, I think the last one I did was the Vignal episode. Um, but oh man, Bill Kahn's episode. Just hearing him talk about the formation of Nexus and. Yeah. You know, I mean, there were so many great ones. Those are the only two most recent ones that I did. But it was cool going back. And also, it is very strange because I do it all. I, I listen to them all in one and a half speed yeah. to get quicker. <laughs> and so then when I put it on regular, Ben's like, today we will be. <laughs> it just <laughs> feels way slow. <laughs> well, that's, that's, a, that's a great tactic. Ben, how long did it take you to do two whole episodes? Uh, I don't know. I think I started doing like Megan, like one and a quarter speed, one and a half speed, or something. But yeah, it's it's involved. <laughs> yeah. I I will say that one of the ones I did was Mark Applebaum, and that was enough for five episodes because he jumps around so much. <laughs> but yeah. We'll yeah, I, I I do have to say when I'm editing, it's and, and I'm making these little these little categorizations of timestamps. I kind of have to make a decision, like okay, we kind of jump topics, but we only did it for a little bit. Uh, it's not worth making a whole category over because if somebody's digging for some information and they see that and then they hear just 10 seconds on a little thing, they're going to be kind of like, wait, what the heck? That was, that was nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and those, uh, the stamps will be on blog spots soon. They're not there yet, but give me a week. They'll be up. <laughs> so yeah, because Megan did such a great job time stamping, Casey has actually asked me to step it up and introduce our guest for today. So, oh, that's right. Okay, this, sure. It's time around. I, I wrote the uh, the guest intro, so I'll I'll go ahead and head this up. So here we go. Our guest this week is, <laughs> is Omar Kaminadez, who has a rating of four point six on Rate My Professor and received the honorary Chili Pepper for being hot. He has high expectations and is very talented and has been described as a quote unquote awesome guy. He is known to be a stickler about certain things, but otherwise is a very nice man. Welcome, Omar. Thank you. Did, did I get a chili pepper? Oh, you got professor? a chili pepper. Don't you worry. Oh, gosh. Oh, I don't know. I don't know why. I, well, I know why. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> He's fishing well, for, fishing for why. I to be here, I think. I think they also, they put the, uh, the, the emphasis symbols in the wrong spot on that rate, my professor. It's definitely Omar Carmenades. Mm. Yeah, I'm not so great with the long last names. You should hear Casey, though. <laughs> it's all right. Oh. 
Oh, yeah, yeah some, some days. Yeah. Well, you guys look, Omar is also the associate professor at Furman University <laughs> and, <laughs> and the front ensemble supervisor and arranger for the Cadets Drum and Bugle Corps. His debut solo CD is titled The Gaia Theory and is out on Rattle Records. Other recent projects is a double disc release entitled The John Sappas Percussion Project. So, yeah, hey, Omar Carminettos, how are you doing? <laughs> Good, I'm doing all right. I am doing great. Uh, are, you, are you regretting being to, to doing this? No, not at all. In fact, this is a nice post-commencement, end of the year, relaxing kind of fun thing to hang out with you all. So I'm glad to be here. You know, my sources have told me that you couldn't record on our regular recording day, which is typically Sunday, because you, quote, needed to spend time with family. What's up with that? Yeah, uh, my wife was out of town, so I was daddy daycare for a day, and I promised them we would go to a trampoline park, and I would spend the whole day with them and not get on the phone. So. Oh, that's oh. awesome. <laughs> how, how long was your wife out of town? Just a day and a half. So. So I did our finals week. Laurel had a gig in Chicago. I, I, ta I mentioned it quickly on the last podcast, but usually finals week is an easy week. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, concerts are over, but we happen to have our percussion ensemble in finals week because that was the only time that the, the our performing arts center was able to schedule it. Mm. And so I had uh, the day Laurel left, dress rehearsal, uh, a, a gear moving, you know, just like loading into the concert hall. Mm -hmm. And the dress rehearsal of the concert, and then five hours of juries, two recording <laughs> sessions, something like oh. four faculty meetings while Laurel was gone, and then maybe you know, five meetings with students or something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I had five babysitters to get me through that week. Great. And you can't use your students, right? Because they're, they're busy doing all those things. Like, yeah, I, correct. I, I normally use my students, and when we have things like that, like we needed a, a sitter during commencement this year, and that that was when my wife was gone, and we couldn't use my students, so we had to get a new one. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Go down our well, list, our, and everything's booked. Yeah, our son is—he's super young. He's like three and a half months old, and oh, congratulations! So thanks. So we're <laughs> you know nervous about new babysitters. I would like to say though that I was not a negligent wife. I scheduled babysitters for all the things that I knew <laughs> you would need them for. Before. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I did. And it was all the added things that I didn't know about. Then, then Casey just kept throwing on the pile. And... Yeah. No, it was, <laughs> like, I feel like so accomplished. It was such a, a type of accomplishment that I've never done before. And no, it wasn't, it like wasn't that bad. I wore yeah. him to our faculty meetings and I wore him all around school as much as I could. And yeah, Laurel setting everything up ahead of time was just, yeah, like so, so, I don't know. It just, it, it felt really good. It was yeah, physically yeah. taxing because I was just wearing him so much. But other than that, it was like, yeah, it was great. I tried I like to wear my, I, that, you know. yeah, I tried to wear my ten-year-old on Sunday. That didn't work so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Omar. Aside from family and kids, what's musically what's happening for you? We definitely want to hear about some of these projects. Oh, well, let's see. It, I mean, right at this moment, you know, it's it's drum corps time. So, you know, and all the drum corps across the country are getting ready to move in in a week or so. So I've been in the in the laboratory writing and sort of putting aside all other things to get this done uh, before uh, we before the core moves in. Um, but you know, long term, uh, I'm in the I'm in the midst of doing all f trying to finish up this John Sothis percussion project you mentioned. Um, and that's been a multi-year. That's oh God. We started that. Uh, Ryan, when was when did when was your first? Uh, I think we started at the end of my junior year. Right? So that would be summer of 2014. Yes. 15, something like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been like three or four years, and um, and we're just now getting ready to release the first CD. So we're we're just working through all that and uh, trying to sign the paperwork and make that all official. Well, Omar, before we get into this topic, let's or. Or, excuse me, before we get into your project, Ben, why don't you give us a little background on the composer, John Sappas? Sure. So I knew we were having Omar on today, and I wanted to do a segment on John Sappas, who I'm actually kind of surprised I haven't talked about before today because he's such a huge percussion composer. And I was, I was very familiar with a few of his works, but I had no idea in recent years he's just exploded his catalog with percussion works. There are over 
25 listed, I, sorry, over 20. I think there's 25 listed on the Promethean Editions website if you want to check those out. So just a quick little background. Um, he was born 1966 to Greek immigrant parents and he grew up in New Zealand. He attended Victoria University of Wellington where he studied composition and piano. And while he was in college, he helped, him, he helped support himself by gigging regularly as a jazz musician and part of a jazz trio, sometimes as often as nine times per week. After he college, he studied composition further in Belgium with Jacqueline Fontaine, and then he returned to New Zealand to teach at Victoria University. He has a work from 1991, which we'll talk more about in a bit, called Matra's Dance that was sort of picked up by Evelyn Glenny. She recorded it and helped bring him to international prominence with this. His big thing that I think he's sort of best known for outside of the percussion world is that a major career highlight of his was in 2004, he composed the ceremonial music for the 2004 Athens Olympic Games opening and closing ceremonies. And then sort of partially as a relation to that, in 2005, he was named an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit, which is sort of like being knighted in Britain. It's that same sort of honor bestowed by the government. Uh, and from what I understand, he's a very big, well-known uh, figure on the New Zealand music scene. I actually had a guest conductor when I was in Miami that was from New Zealand, and I asked her, oh, do you know John Sathis? And she said, oh, yeah, he's my, uh, he was my theory and composition teacher in college. So, mm -hmm. um, But yeah, and then his music, it combines the sort of jazz harmony background with improvisational feel and elements of rock music and textures from minimalism. And I have a little quote from him talking about his own music that I'd like to read. He says, when I write music, it's not a sense of inventing the experience as much as it is a sense of finding something that exists at the remote periphery of what I know. It is like seeing things that aren't really there in the corner of one's eye, but not spinning around to view them because then they would simply cease to be. It is a case of being aware of a thing in one's peripheral vision and while staring straight ahead, trying to decipher without looking at it, the true nature of what it is. What one is finding is exactly the right thing for any given moment in a musical work, which is like super deep, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, he has his works are all published by Promethean Editions, which he's a quote unquote house composer for. And like I said, Evelyn Glennie has sort of championed quite a few of his works and Omar has recorded uh, a couple of them on his 2012 album, The Gaia Theory. He has 4x4 and Waiting still recorded on that album. And then he also has, we'll get into it in a minute, as he mentioned, the John Sothis Percussion Project, which is a double CD release that, according to the internet, started in his <laughs> spring 2015 sabbatical. And so I just wanted to point out the sort of, I think, the three most well-known John Sothis percussion works and give a little quick discussion of those. One is the aforementioned Matras Dance from 1991. Um, it was, I don't know if it was actually commissioned for or written for Evelyn Glenny, but she's certainly the one that took it under her wing and sort of performed it internationally. And in John Sothis's own words, he says, the title refers to a dance performed by a group of fanatics in one of Frank Herbert's Dune books. The dance was non-repeating and exhausting for the dancer who often collapsed or died before completing the extremely long, complex routine. Created, created during an intense eight days and actually commissioned as a violin solo, this was the first piece which suggested to me I might have some future in composing. Following its premiere, Matra's dance passed from my hands into Evelyn Glennie's and has now seen much more of the world than I will ever manage to. Uh, and there is, like I said, it's originally for percussion and piano, and Omar now has a version for mallet quartet and solo percussion that's also published by Promethean Editions. The next work I wanted to talk about is from 2005. It's called One Study, One Summary. It's a two movement work. And from what I can tell, you can sort of perform each movement alone or both as a set. It was commissioned by Pedro Carnero with support from Creative New Zealand. It's written for marimba with junk percussion and electronics. Uh, the first movement sort of begins tranquil and works into uh, tech, no, sorry, this is, I think the second movement, one summary is, it begins sort of tranquil and works into this sort of techno groove and it's marimba only. The second movement is this sort of rock and roll tour de force. It's fast paced uh, with almost the whole time uh, there are quick changes between marimba and the junk percussion setup and it's just like heavy metal marimba. There are some amazing recordings of both movements by Pedro Carnero on YouTube. And there are a few other great recordings out there as well on YouTube, including one by Omar. 
And there's also a sort of a fun, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Martin Grubinger and his pl percussive planet ensemble, but they have, they do a little snippet of it with Yuja Wang on piano, who was like one of the top piano solists in the world. And it's kind of corny, like they go into this little like jam session. Maybe like a samba, like a yeah. samba jam session, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of cool to check out. I mean, it's Yuja Wang, can't go wrong. And then the last one I want to talk about that's the, the sort of, it seems to be the hip one nowadays is Kyoto which was written in 2011. It was commissioned by the Jew Percussion Group. And if you aren't familiar with Jew Percussion Group, we talked about them on episode 25 with Ijin Fang. Uh, it's inspired by a 1976 improvisation by Keith Jarrett, which was performed in Kyoto, hence the name. It's a percussion quintet scored for two marimbas, two vibraphones and a small percussion setup. And then one of the vibraphone players also plays a little bit of glockenspiel and there's a triangle in that part as well. One of the vibraphone parts is sort of a soloist part. It's, I think, significantly more difficult than the other ones. It's in sort of an ABA form. It's all the same tempo, but the outer sections are sort of more riveting, exciting sections, and the inner section's a little more calm with a bowed marimba part. And if you'd like to hear this work, there's an excellent recording by the Frost Percussion Group on YouTube with yours truly playing the bowed marimba <laughs> part. <laughs> so uh, go check that out. So yeah, those are- That's a good uh, recording three three big uh, it seems percussion works of john sothis right now but out of quite a few about 25 he has a timpani concerto he has a concerto for piano and percussion he has other percussion quartet quintet types works so definitely check out the music of john sothis so mm -hmm. omar you have this huge project and i'm in particular interested to hear about your uh arranging duties that you've done on this stuff <laughs> Yeah, uh, so the project started from my first CD, The Gaia Theory. You, you mentioned those two works on there, 4x4 four four and Waiting Still. 4x4 uh, four four was a commission uh, for, it's basically, it's essentially a drum set quartet, but it's like a deconstructed uh, drum set. And so th that piece was a part of a consortium commission that I led. And, um, you know, I have a recording up on YouTube and we recorded it for the CD. Um, and I was talking with John about a second piece to have on there, and um, we had talked, and I had asked him about this idea of arranging this piece, Waiting Still, uh, that was on YouTube, and I think it disappeared. I, don't see, I haven't seen it in a long time, but it's for Piano and Gamelon, and it's a very still piece, very plaintive. Uh, there's just an FC, eighth note, ostinato, basically, essentially through the whole thing. Yeah, real quick, and, to interrupt, but I was going to say, his music okay. seems to have two characters. There's, like, the crazy, like, Matra's dance character, oh, yeah. and then there's mm -hmm. that, like, he has another piece called Fragment that's just this super, super eerie, relaxed, calm, yep. almost Bartok mm -hmm. night music. Yep, and the, um, the, this piece, Waiting Still, is part, of a, is, is part of a trio of works that are built around this, like, eighth note, ostinato ones. Um, waiting for the airplane, waiting still, and then um, oh, the title escapes me. There's another one that's about a, uh, a guy riding a train um, that was on my list for, to include in this project, but um, waiting still ended up being the piece. So for that CD, I arranged waiting still for two mallet players and a gamelan player, which we recorded twice. We did it once with a gamelan player, and then once submitted, uh, re-recorded, sorry, and substituted the gamelan for vibraphone. Um, so there's two different versions on the CD and John liked the arrangement so much. He goes, I've had this, I've, I've been, I have like a, a bunch of works that either don't get played a lot or, um, or that I just feel always would have been better as percussion. And would you mind jumping on and maybe trying to do some of these? Cause I liked your waiting still arrangement so much. And I was like, sure. Um, and then once we got talking, I was like, it turned into about 11 pieces <laughs> and it was like, well, I had a sabbatical coming up. And I thought that'd be great, um, a great project to take on and try. And the, the original goal was to write all 11 works in that semester to arrange all 11, which is about two CDs worth, about 150 minutes of music, and then record them in consecutive summers. Um, I am finishing up the last one now. <laughs> so um, it's basically seven, seven chamber works and four concertos. Um, and we finished the Chamber Works, uh, let's see, two years ago, and we've been in post-production for a while, and that's the, that's the one I, I literally just signed the paperwork to get this coming out soon. Um, and then I am just finishing up the last concerto now, so um, I can go ahead and list the works if you want me to. I can try and rattle them off by memory. Um, sure. So in the Chamber side, uh, it's all percussion, I think eight or smaller um, is what it turned out to be, but it's 
Mantras Dance is one of them. So we turned it from percussion soloist and piano to percussion soloist and mallet quartet. Um, and then there is his piano quintet, which um, was for string quartet and piano, which we turned into a percussion sextet and piano. Um, there's a pair of works called Corybas and Aegean that were written for the New Zealand String Quartet that um, I arranged. One is for a mallet sextet with a tom player. It was sort of modeled on Kyoto with that one tom part. Um, and then, and I added that, obviously, that wasn't in the original string quartet. And then Aegean is also for, uh, was originally for a string, sorry, sorry, string trio. Um, and we, I arranged that for a mallet quartet. And then there was a guitar solo that he had, had just been commissioned when we started this called Moiska. And uh, I arranged that for a mallet duo. And then there was a piano work entitled Jedatura which we, I re rearranged for a mallet duo as well, which um, Escape 10 premiered at PASIC uh, a couple years back, and they did a fantastic job with it. And then, um, how many, I feel like I'm missing a chamber piece. Um, and then the concertos are uh, his Jin, which is a marimba quartet and string orchestra, Planet Damnation, which is for a timpani and orchestra, and View from Olympus, which is his big percussion piano double concerto, um, and then his um, three psalms, which is a piano concerto, and basically we just blew we well blew all those out or reduced them, depending how you want to look at it, um, for like a percussion orchestra, and just kept the soloist parts. So we've been I, I've been we've been chipping away at that for three or four years now. Um, it's me doing the writing, and then a collection of Furman students, Furman alums, plus friends and um, you know calling in favors. <laughs> Anyone that wants to come to Greenville for a week and record, we've been doing this every summer. Um, took last summer off, but I think we're three sessions in, um, and we're hoping to have the fourth one this summer. Holy cow. Yeah, and then the plan is to release those on two CDs, publish all the scores, and hopefully get the ensemble together and do a little tour, both in the United States and in New Zealand. That's, that's a stretch. We're trying to—that's <laughs> expensive, but we're trying to make it work. So, Omar, I have two questions. One mm -hmm. is, uh, especially with Matras Dance, do you do that unconducted? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. I played the version with piano, not the new one obviously, and it's a uh, it's a beast. It's yeah, yeah. You have to have a <laughs> piano player that has serious rhythm and I was lucky to have that for sure. Jamila. Yeah, yeah, there's there's so, essentially yeah. it's essentially a, a, a you essentially need a percussionist that plays piano. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and then you blow that out for four people and that, you know, adds Granted, it's four percussionists, so we can rely on each other's time. Yeah. Um, you know, because we kind of feel all feel time, you know, essentially uh, pretty similarly, but it also adds some variables though, because there are these parts that were split between the right and left hand at the high and low end of the piano that are now split between two people. Yeah, yeah, I know. And that, that, that adds a whole different layer of challenges. Nathan Ratliff at UNT was a big piano, he was a piano mm -hmm. and percussionist, and I think he got his his money's worth out of playing oh, yeah. piece for he, he Seeing him play it was when I first heard it, yeah. when I was a master's yeah. student at UNT, yep. And then I have and one I, other question. Uh, John Sapas has a work, and I'm going to spell the title, and I would like for everyone to try and pronounce it. I'll put it in our little group chat here. I think, I think I already know which one this is. P-S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y-S-M. Yep. I don't care because you said Gaia wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Syzygism? I, I, I don't I got, know. Yeah, yeah that's right. Laurel, that's right. Syzygism. Yeah, syzygism. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, take that, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> it's Gaia and it's syzygism. Yeah. yeah. That's that's an awesome piece, by the way. Uh, no, that Pedro, is, that Pedro, is Pedro, a crazy word, Ben. Pedro commissioned that one, I think, too? Um, I, think. I don't know. Probably. I mean, I know oh, he was in the ensemble that commissioned it? I can't remember. Okay, no more picking on yeah. Ben. Yeah, yeah, no more. <laughs> <laughs> So while we're next while, while we're paused, you guys are talking about mantras dance. One of our DMA students, Kai, who's joined us on the podcast, asked me to play the piano part to it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I bet I can." And he gave me the score a couple of days ago, and I was like, "Whoa, does this normally go well with pianists?" And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> you, you, you have to be you have to be ready as the percussions, I think, to move and bend a little bit if need be. <laughs> yeah, geez. yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, and you listen to the Evelyn Glennie recording, and there's quite a bit of bending going on there. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because, you know, 
I think I, you know, my recording with the Malik Quartet, I, I'm, I'm, I did, the, I played in the ensemble for most of the record, but I did that part. I played the soloist part on the record. Um, I think it's like the fifth recording, maybe, or something, or fifth or sixth. There's a few out there. And it's interesting to hear everyone's different interpretations of that. I think, you know, Norm Weinberg has a recording out that, um, I think he used like some congas or he substituted some stuff out. Um, Evelyn uses some rototoms, which John offers as a substitution. So it's neat to hear everyone's like setup choices. It's kind of, it's got its own little life like that. You know, like everyone's like, what setup do you use them? You know, do you use the timpani on the bottom or do you substitute with toms? There are a couple people that do and don't. Um, so it's neat that that piece has that kind of flexibility. Well, this is such a huge project and like what a amazingly, uh, I mean, long-term labor of love to John mm -hmm. Pappas. What is it? I'm, I'm just kind of curious. What was it about his music that made you, made you pick him for such a like dedication? Yeah. Well, uh, it goes back. Um, I think I told John this, but it goes back to when I was a first year master's student at UNT and I was just uh, once a week or so, I would just go to the library and just find scores. Um, I would just pick something up and look at it and be like, oh, I'll check this out, you know, or, or not, and sometimes put it back. And um, I, one of the first score I ever saw of his was A View from Olympus. And um, as I was looking through the score, that was the first time that I saw, I had no idea who he was. I, had, I hadn't heard any of his pieces. Um, and um, the, when I was looking at the score, it, it, they were rhythms that like I would have written. You know, so with John, these are the first, um, he's, he's one of the first composers that has, I feel like has this, like if I were to ever be a composer, which I'm not, um, I can't help but think my music would sound something like his because I think we have a, a similar sense of the way we f hear and feel rhythm. Um, so that got me started on his music and then, he, you know, as the years gone, I just sort of fell more and more in love with it. And then I had the opportunity to commission him um, for this piece, 4 by 4 and then it just sort of took off from there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to laugh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> to mute. <laughs> Megan, can you, Megan can, you, can you give Ben and I an assist? <laughs> or maybe Ryan. Was Ryan Ben? <laughs> <laughs> oh man! This is, this, is, this is a timeout, by the way. <laughs> That's all good. Uh, hey, it was drum dance. I just drum dances. That's what I'm forgetting. Yeah. Now, is that the piece that Evelyn Glennie plays? Evelyn Glennie and piano, right? Well, she plays That's drum Macher's dances dance. and Macher's dance. Yeah. Does she play drum dance? She plays drum dances. Yeah, I actually saw I her actually... play it live when I was like I did... a junior in high school. As did I. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and it was so cool. And that's the one that has, like, one of the movements has glockenspiel too, right? Yeah, you have to play glock and bass drum and kick at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I definitely saw her play that when I was in high school. Yeah. I, I saw her doing that, and she had the coolest stick drop slash recovery I've ever seen. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, you've talked about that a lot. I've talked about it before. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, it was cool. Like, yeah, the, the, the stick fell, and it was approaching in this pause, and... They pop, they stopped together, the stick hit the floor and like started clacking and bouncing and she just like, slammed it to a stop with her high heel and it was just just unequivocally badass and wow. off, mm -hmm. off the cuff and yeah, Evelyn Glennie's really good. I don't you know, uh, people people say lots of things, but yeah, yeah, dude, I mean, yeah, I, I mean I like, it's like way good. Yeah, it's like yeah. you like even I made a little like, yeah, they like kinda of bend it's like, yeah, but it's a pretty badass recording, like mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, way good. Well, you guys, we have this good selection of Facebook questions. And, Omar, I got to tell you, I had a hard time sifting out the real ones from the fake ones. <laughs> Blame my friends. Luis <laughs> Rivera. <laughs> it was mostly it was mostly Luis Rivera there. Yeah, uh, yeah, that guy. And uh, it seems to be a lot about a Tesla car and some vehicle. <laughs> Can you just, like, for my benefit, explain what's going on there? Um, he just razzes me because I have, I have one. You have a Tesla car? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you can't fit multiple marimbas in it? You can. That's okay. why he was, you, you can fit a five octave in, 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 in one of them. We actually have two. And, so um, he's, so he's wrong. Yeah. I think, I think he's more being sarcastic on these questions. So we should strike his episode from the record for I you. I think you should. I think you should remove him from the list and any further list you may come up with and anywhere in the next 10, 15, 20 years, or yeah. maybe in perpetuity. Yeah. Should be removed. 
Yeah, how's that, Lewis? <laughs> I'm glad we can help him. <laughs> well, a real question comes from Robbie Green, and this kind of takes us away. And I'd be happy if we come back around to John Sathis. That'd be just great. Sure. But just to kind of travel into some uh, other territory and a, a more traditional type question, what is your greatest musical or teaching failure, and what have you learned from it? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I think we'd all have lots of those, right, to, to, to think about and sift through. I, I, you know, and I, when I saw that question, I got to thinking, like, I, I, I feel like I fail at something every day, right? Like, that lesson, I could have made a little more out of that hour. Or we could have, I could have gotten the student to play a little more expressively if I just maybe said the right words or whatever. Um, or over the course of a semester, maybe like, oh, you know, that month was really weak. Like, I was just not fully in it. Um, so, it's, you know, there's a lot of those small fa failures that I th that I've think that I, I think about all the time that I take real personally um, that I try to correct on. So it's like the little small micro corrections. I think that, you know, that's not that it's my greatest failure, but I think that's what comes to mind first is like, um, you know, we all as teachers, I think we can all find something that we can improve upon every day. And uh, I find myself, as I'm sure we all do, just reflecting every day, like, how could I have done that better? You're like, oh, that lesson didn't go quite as well. or. Um, why did that piece sound like crap on the percussion ensemble concert? I don't, you know, what could I have done, you know? Um, so there, there's lots of reflection that goes on in that regard. But if I had a single, if I had to point it out to something, I think the, the my first real audition, um, I guess it would be my second. My first was auditioning for, um, the Walt, for uh, a, a parade in Walt Disney World when I was just out of high school. And I was just, I was so happy to get that one. But my first, like, pro, like, prep for months, audition was for the um, the Hellcats at West Point uh, towards the end of my time in North Texas. And it was a super stacked round. Like, I mean, Jeff Prosperi got it, but he was in that round and mm -hmm. uh, Troy Bro and Rob Marino. And there were all these great players that were in this round. And, um, you know, and I was at the end of my time at North Texas. It has nothing to do with North Texas, but I was just really burned out at the time. You know, I was like, I, I was looking forward to getting back to Florida and um, maybe getting back to my Disney gig for a bit. And so I, and then this, this thing came along, this audition and I was like, oh, well, I'm just going to get, I'm just going to audition and win that. And that'll be the rest of my life. And it'll be great. And little did I know about auditions, like, you know, the odds are always against you, right? I mean, it's one, you're one of a pool of how many, right? So the odds are, uh, never in your favor. So, um, losing that audition is, and the guys were great. The audition experience was fantastic, but losing that audition was my first real loss and walking away from that just kind of, a, not assuming, but just kind of thinking like, oh yeah, I'll just get this gig and it'll be mine. Um, having to learn from that, like, oh my God, you know, like this is, this was legit. And I could hear the people through the door and like, they sounded fantastic and I did not. <laughs> and learning that, learning the level that it takes to, to, to audition for anything, you know, I think that was a big wake up call for me. Um, and it took me years to figure out how to get past that, you know, how to, how to, um, improve upon that. And it took, um, yeah, I'd say the better part of two, two years, I think to, to, to feel like I was ready to audition for something again, yeah. um, all from that experience, you know, and, and there was a lot of coaching. I ended up at Florida state with John Parks and he ended up coaching me through a lot of it, um, through some tough love and some soft and some nice love as well, you know, some, but you know, losing auditions there right on the, right on the heels of that, you know, was a real big lesson for me. And, um, it taught me to get my act together really quick. It took it took a while, but uh, it really did force me to re-examine everything I knew about making music and playing and preparing music, and and of course auditioning, which is a skill in and of itself. Wow. Yeah. The, hearing your answer really changes how I think of Robbie's question now. You know, and mm -hmm. how we think of that the greatest failure. You know, you're describing an audition you lost, but it did a great thing for you. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I don't, I don't begrudge that audition for a second, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rob, Robbie has a few others and I'll just keep cruising along here until uh, someone else chimes in. But, uh, if you could go back and talk to yourself as an undergrad, what advice would you give? <laughs> yeah, I thought about this one. Um, practice better. <laughs> I was right. such a terrible practicer or a you know, a practitioner of practice. I was, I was so terrible at it. Um, because I feel like I was slightly gifted with the ability to read pretty well. And I let that coast me through most of my undergrad. And, um, 
it really ended up catching up with me later. Um, I honestly at the West Point audition and at Florida State and my DMA and uh, a couple of things later. And it's been a struggle since then to like know that there is a way to practice. There is a, there is a rigorous practice methodology that exists, and it's become my obsession actually since um, since I graduated from college and have been in school now because I see so many signs of that in my students, you know, because I, I teach at a, at a very rigorous, a very academically rigorous liberal arts school. So these kids are trying to balance practicing with writing, you know, papers about Plato and then writing and then astronomy papers and all these other things. And it's like, okay, how do you, um, how do you teach students to make the most out of 30 minutes, you know, if that's all they have? Because sometimes that literally legitimately is all they have. Um, or an hour, or how, how do you make time? How do you manage your time to make practice uh, happen? And that's that's sort of been my um, thing is, you know, practice better. And then if I had to say two other things to myself as an undergrad would be to show up on time and be cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not that I would, not that I was either of those things, but I think it's advice that we never, we don't hear enough as young kids, you know, is like showing up and, and playing your part and, stopping there and just being a good pro. I think that's um, a great lesson to have when you're young. Yeah. I just got a, a question just came in from the co-host chat feed. It says, of all the undergraduate students you saw at UNT, who was the one that inspired you the most? <laughs> There's so many of them. There's like 130 of them there at the time. Um, but did no, but I can stick out? Is this a trick question? Ben, were you an undergrad at UNT? Were I think you... this is a Brian Nosny incident again. <laughs> so, so did you manage to go to school together and not know Ben? Ben was a student there. Did I? Yeah, we were at UNT together. I didn't teach you, did I? No. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so <felt> really bad. <laughs> did we? Yeah. Oh man, Ben. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same thing. Brian Nosny had no idea. Honestly, <laughs> you, honestly, you all are like, you know, like the undergrads, there's just so many of them. So I had my 20, well, you know, I had my 20. I didn't stand out, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I am sorry, Ben. Oh no, I'm, I'm oh, kidding. No, no, it's, no, I know, but no, still, it it's like, holy cow. How did I, remember? the whole time, the whole two years? Yeah, uh, well, I was, uh, I got there in 2005. I was there with Michael D'Angelo, who I'm sure you knew. I was about to name Michael D'Angelo as a student yeah. that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would be the one, yeah. Yeah, God, that guy just doesn't know how to be bad at anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but okay, so you came in my second year. I guess. Yeah. I guess. I was checked out by then, so that, that's why I don't recognize. <laughs> I'm no, kidding, wait, wait, Mark Ford. I'm kidding. Brian? What? Sorry. Were you there for two years with Brian Ben? Yeah. No, I think I was just. I think Brian was the same year as Omar. I think he was. Yeah. After my first year. So, See, so um, I, at least I used to get a, kind of a pass on that, right? Because it was only one year <laughs> of the two I was there. No, I mean, and honest to God, I mean, Michael D'Angelo was was such a force to be reckoned with. I mean, he was from the second he walked into that school, the best drum set player. I mean, just he got he was in like the, he got into the two o'clock lab band his first semester, I think. I think so. I yeah, remember. I mean, uh, he'll correct me, yeah. but yeah. 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 Not a and... jazz major, too. Oh, he wasn't. No. He was a classical performance major. Oh, I thought he was. I think okay. he's maybe the only person ever that played in the one o'clock glad band, the wind symphony, and the symphony orchestra. Wow. Yeah. He's a bad boy. Hi, Mike. Yeah, good for him. Sure you out there. <laughs> <laughs> wow, very cool. Well, well, what we're talking about past schools real quick, you said you went to UNF. Did you and Megan? Uh, FSU. Oh, sorry, what did I say? I, yeah, FSU. Thank you. FSU. Wow. Did, you, did you and Megan overlap? We yeah. did by a year. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So my my I fall. Megan. <laughs> we, we we spent like we spent way too much time in a in a budget truck together, driving yeah. back and forth from Pasig. So. We're best friends. Yeah, and we've we've become best friends since then. So. Ben does these self sabotage things. <laughs> yeah. This is a really intense episode. <laughs> I know this was really fun just a little while ago. If there if there was ever an episode that needed the group chat other than Ted Edcat's episode, this might be the best one we've had. So <laughs> My gosh. I'm gonna screenshot the whole thing. It's funny. I saw that question come by. And I was like, why would he ask that? 
So, well, we've sorry, got more Dave. Facebook questions for you, so I, sure. I think let's just let's cruise along to another one. Mm -hmm. Paul's gonna grab one for us. So I, I've got them up here. Uh, so we have one from Brian Raddick, and he says, "What's the best advice, top three, you have for a young percussionist trying to make their career in this profession?" Yeah, not to not to be a, a broken record, but be prepared, show up on time, and be cool. Right? That's about as as easy as it gets. Is you know you don't have to be. Uh, I tell my son this when he's playing baseball because he's this tall. He's not tall, but he's like this really skinny kid. He's not the fastest. He's not the strongest, but he's dependable. He plays first base and he catches balls when they're thrown to them, and he gets the job done. And I think that's a great thing to tell students when they're young, especially is like you know, we all think we're going to go out there and we're going to, you know, be marimba soloists for all of our lives and tour the world. Um, and for some people that works out. Some people. Um, it doesn't, and we, we all have to find our path. But, you know, being a pro, it's 90% showing up on time, prepared, and just being a good person to be around. So those are my three little things. Yeah, and if I could add to that, we had Craig Morris here at Tarleton, who's the former principal of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra trumpet. And uh, someone asked him a similar question, and he said, like, there's no, like, there's no secret answer, but just do the things you know you're supposed to do. Yep. Like, you know, practice your scales and, you know, like, practice your yeah. long tones, whatever. Like, it's amazing how many people want to be better at the trumpet, but don't think to just like, yeah, open up the practice, book and practice the trumpet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've got some more Facebook questions. So earlier you were talking about arranging um, with your CD project. And this is another question from Brian. He says, when you write music, how do you personally know where to start and when to stop writing and walk away? <laughs> <laughs> um, I always start at the beginning. I never start somewhere in the middle or at the end or anything like that. Like literally the double bar line in the beginning, treble clef, key signature, time signature. Um, and, you know, arranging and composing are two different things. But, uh, you know, I, I, if there's any commonality between the two, I think it's that um, when I'm writing, my brain is usually like three phrases ahead of where the music is on the page and where my fingers are or, or my, you know, my sticks are or my mallets or whatever I'm doing at the time. So I don't ever really put a note down until I have every, until I have about three phrases ahead written in my head. Um, so that I know where I'm going and then I know, and then that's what it does. I just, you know, if I want to measure one, I'm usually three phrases ahead. If I'm a measure two, I'm three phrases plus two measures ahead. Um, and that, that, you know, that, that wave just keeps moving forward through the whole piece. Um, in terms of my process. Now, knowing when to stop, honestly, uh, this is the bad time of year to ask me because there is no stopping. Um, you know, it's drum corps season plus high school band season. Um, so, you know, and school's out. And, but my kids are still in school, so I have like, you know, seven, eight hours a day to myself. So there is no stopping because deadlines are coming. <laughs> and, you know, bands want their charts so they can start writing drill. And there's so many people depending on you to get these things done. So, um, I'm almost always under the gun with these things. So I, I rarely have a project with like no timeline where I just can walk away when I want to. So it's it's more learning how to press through that wanting to quit <laughs> for the day. You know, like, oh, if I can just get to halfway through, maybe then I can finish it tomorrow, you know. Um, but I, I rarely stop when I want to. <laughs> mm. So how many, you know, we know you're doing the cadets show, but how many other kind of band shows do you write each year? Um, at the moment, I think I have eight high schools, plus, plus the cadets, yeah, plus the John Sothis stuff. So it's a lot of time behind a computer and at the keyboard or at the piano, rather. Um, and with me, I write by hand first. So I have to write everything by hand and then I input it. Uh, so that just makes it take twice as long. But I feel like I learned it better. Like I know what I'm, I know what I'm, it's like taking notes in a class, right? Like you learn the material better if you write it, if you actually form the letters yourself and not hit a button. Um, I feel like th that's the same way when I when I write. Like I understand it better when I write it by hand first. Um, you mentioned arranging different from composing, and this is just a ignorant question on, on my end. How, how much would you say like percentage is writing original composition with your time versus just arranging? I mean, time, it's probably like 80-20 arrangement, arranger, arrangements to compositions. I'm mostly an arranger. Like, I, I, uh, you know, Brian Nazi, I, I cracked a joke to him once, and I said, I, I'm, I'm a terrible composer, you know. 
Um, I have no original ideas. <laughs> um, but you know, but, but every every like high school band, you know, they need a they need an original drum solo or they need an original something. So there's a, there's spurts of original things, you know, uh, interspersed throughout in there. Even when I do arrangements, sometimes you have to get from like one key to another, or you have to get from one place to another. So you have to invent something. So um, I consider myself much more an arranger than, than a composer. Gotcha. In that regard. Mm -hmm. We have a student here who he, I, I know he would love to know, how did you, I mean, he's, he's definitely kind of, digging into arranging for bands in our mm -hmm. area. And he's said many times, I'm thinking of Elijah, he's, he's said several times, you know, he would like it to be, you know, a, a bigger thing, something that is, you know, uh, he would love to do eight bands. A, a mm -hmm. summer. How, how does, I don't know, what, what advice would you give to him who they, they've gotten their foot in the door and they, they want to make it a, a bigger part of their gig? Yeah, I mean, my path, my path was I wrote I had a great uh, percussion director slash band director, um, Rhett Cox, who teaches at Timber Creek High School in Orlando now. But he was my band director my senior year of high school, and he actually let me write the indoor drumline show as a senior in high school um, that we took to WGI. And you know, um, I wrote the ba the battery parts, and he wrote the front ensemble parts. Um, okay. And so for me, that, that you know, just that first opportunity. There, what, there's a Malcolm Gladwell book about this, about how Bill Gates got all this terminal time back when he was a kid, and that's what got him in the door with wanting, you know, wanting to work with computers. And he just he just had so many hours accumulated by the time he was even of age, before while, while, when other people his age were getting started, you know, that he was just ahead of the curve. And not that I was ahead of the curve, but I think that got me in the door to then write for the same high school once I graduated. And then once I did that, you know, um, you you write for another one basically for free. You don't you don't charge really much. And then, um, and then once I got my foot into teaching at the drum corps level, um, then you know sometimes a gig rolls in here and there, and you just do a good enough job, you know. And it's it's a lot like being a professional musician. You 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 deliver on time. You're nice to work with, and the 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 charts and the 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 music makes the kids sound good. If you do those things you'll get lots of work. Because mm -hmm. there are how many high school marching bands in the country that need arrangers? I mean, there's a lot. And um, if you're those things, if you can just do those things, write a book that makes the kids sound good, that isn't over their heads or under, um, and that is on time and isn't exorbitantly expensive, I think you can get a lot of work as a young arranger. You know? So as long as you do those things, it, it will it'll kind of grow itself, right? I mean, you no know, guarantees, but yeah, I mean, if you're, yeah, one thing builds on another, and as long as you are looked at in a positive light and the people like that you, that you write for, like right, work, you know, ha like having you and hiring you, they'll keep you, and then they'll refer you to another, and then another, and then another, and, um, you know, there are people that do this full-time. I mean, there are people that um, write 16, 20, 25 bands. I mean, I'm, I'm part-time. I, I consider myself part-time in this because I have my job at Furman and my family, um, so eight for me is where I max out, you know, but there are people that do 15, 16, 20. Yeah. How many until you want to like blow your brains out? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Paul and, Rennick said, Paul Rennick has a percussion arranging class and he said he, he arranges, I think it was at the time it was a hundred drumline shows per year. Mm -mm. Yep. I, 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 I don't, I don't begrudge him, but that's not me. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> Paul, like we, you know, we're all just astounded at that. Like, how do you yeah. do that? And Paul said, you know, like. After a while, like you, you kind of you kind of have your licks, and like I think it's almost mindless for him. I mean, he just can just pump this stuff out, and Sandy does yeah. the pit bulls, oh. and yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're they're a dynamic mind, I'm Like so, if Paul charges how much, you know, and he does a hundred of them. Like how much is Paul making a year? A lot, probably. <laughs> Pretty good yeah. money, I'm sure. Yeah. Hey, mm -hmm. hey, Ben, does Paul remember you from UNT? Maybe. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Megan, you have something. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask Omar, you know, I mean, you've been in the drum corps activity for a while now and um, through marching and then teaching as a staff member, as you mentioned, and then um, you were caption head of Boston Crusaders for a while. And now you're working with the cadets. Um, I'm wondering two things. One very simple thing. What can you tell us about the upcoming cadets show? Oh. <laughs> if anything, if anything, uh -huh. for us to look forward, look yeah. forward to this summer. Um, and then also just what, if you had to pick one thing that keeps you, keeps drawing you back to the activity, 
What do you think it is? Mm -hmm. uh, so to your first question, um, you know, the, the core is going through some change at the moment. You know, it's no secret. Um, so, you know, for us, uh, the show is meant to be a sort of uh, rejoicing of what it means to be a cadet, if I could just maybe put it that way, um, and, and of the history of the Corps, and of, um, and, and I, f I feel even weird saying the history of the drum corps, because I've already been there two years, you know? At, at Boston, I was there for 10, and, uh, or pushing 10, at least, and so it, I, I had history. You know, here I'm at a core that's arguably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, in DCI, and um, I'm sitting here talking about history when I don't, I don't have that perspective yet. Um, but uh, you know, hearing the design team talk, you know, it's 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 going to be um, a lot of fun. It's gonna, there's going to be some good repertoire. There's going to be some um, repertoire that maybe we've mentioned already in this podcast. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. In fact, I was writing all day today, and I'm I'm really um, jazzed up about this section I just wrote. So, any cool. cadet, any cadet pit kids listening, it's coming your way in the next couple nice. days. Um, and then, what was number two? Oh, um, if there's one thing that can you could pinpoint that keeps drawing you back to the activity. Mm, that's right. Um, specifically DCI. What is yeah. it? Um, you know, DCI is tough because it's it is laborious. It is a slog. It is hard, and. Um, and it's intense. I mean, this is this is the peak of the activity, and you know, it's really easy to get angry and emotional when there's so much at stake. Um, and so, and this is going to sound really weird, but like I, I, because I have my full time job and because I have my family, like I, I don't need the drum corps activity to survive. Like it's not paying my bills. Right. Um, and with the softest thing and other things, you could argue that I don't even need it artistically. However. However, what keeps me coming back is uh, my my last year of doing it, my last year of marching. Um, at, I was at the Boston Crusaders, and um, I got awarded the Jim Ott Scholarship, which they give to one person a year um, in, in DCI. I did not expect to get it. I, in fact, I applied for it in May, and over the course of tour, anyone who's been on tour, you know, you just forget about the real world for three months. Yeah. And so August rolls around, and I had I had I completely forgotten I had applied for this thing, and we're in the middle of like one of our last rehearsal days, and there's this committee of people like in suits, like standing behind us, <laughs> um, watching us rehearse, and you know, I'm in my I have no shirt on, I'm sweating, and I have my drums on my back, and whatever, and we stop, and our captain goes, Omar, he pulls me out, he goes, you, some people want to talk to you, and uh, this committee, the sponsors of musical enrichment, that's the organization, they told me I won the Jim Ott. And, um, you know, it was a pretty hefty scholarship that really helped me finish my last year of college. Um, and I got to walk out during finals retreat and get recognized and all this. Um, all this is to say is that th that day um, I was like, I'm going to give back to this activity until I have until it doesn't want me anymore, basically. Um, so that's why I, that's why I keep coming back, you know, because. Uh -huh. It's it's a slog. It's hard work, you know. And uh, what keeps me coming back is is n knowing what I got out of it, and knowing that there's a chance that I'm there might be one or two kids that might get the same thing out of it because I was there, you know. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. And also, I think, you know, the the activity is lucky to have someone like you who is a collegiate percussion professor and who's such a well-rounded percussionist, you know, a performer, a teacher, and an arranger, uh, because, you know, some people dedicate their whole life to the DCI mm -hmm, activity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not to say that they're not well-rounded, but you offer a very unique perspective, having all of these other um, other experiences and things that you're doing on a regular basis. So I think that helps the activity from not pigeonholing itself also, you know? And, and I noticed that when I was working with you at Boston Crusaders, you know, it was so refreshing to have someone writing for the front ensemble who like regularly plays and teaches percussion ensemble music. It was way more, um, it was idiomatic and it was interesting. And, you know, for, for me as the teacher, but definitely for the performers as well. So cool. yeah, I think you're right. Well, thanks. That, that, that means a lot. You know, I, I, when, you know, last year was my first year at the cadets and they have a long history of what their front ensemble is and sounds like. And, um, you know, I was, I was really careful to try and not take a complete left turn with that, but to try and 
be myself at the same time. But I tell you, the thing that got those kids the most, that surprised them the most, was when I tell them I never marched in a front ensemble. Yeah. Like, what? How? How do you know how to do this? Well, you know, it's my job. <laughs> you know, it's my full time. And, and to be honest, like, you know, a lot of people talk about, like, arranging for drum corps versus arranging for, in, you know, percussion ensemble or percussion. So it's all the same to me, you know? Like, there, I mean, there's a there's a competitive part of it in drum corps. Like, you have to play hard things at times. Um, but as far as the art of it, like, I, I get as much joy and I feel just as fulfilled after having written a drum corps chart as of having written an ensemble commission, you know, for an arrangement. Uh, I find those equally gratifying. And um, and they push me, you know, because, uh, you know, you Ben, you read that quote from John Sothis about, Every time he writes, it's like you're trying to capture something that exists at the edge of your periphery. Um, I actually read that a long time ago, and that's been my line for ever since I read it. it was like well, every time I write, I got to not do what I know, but I got to know I got to write at the edge of what I know, so that I become better every time. And um, you know, having the opportunity to do it so many times with drum corps and with high school bands, it always gets me that much better faster. I think you know, as as an arranger. So I have a sort of follow up question to this because I'm not from the DCI activity at all, really. But mm -hmm. um, I had a student, a private student that was in high school that was very into it and would come in every single week all excited about telling me about something. And then he would tell me about how so-and-so was doing a piece by John Adams and he had gone and listened to the piece by John Adams. And I was, I thought that was really cool that all of a sudden the high school students is, is interested in pieces that they would probably never, never encounter before. But it also made me wonder, uh, and I saw, I guess it was this past summer, I saw the show in San Antonio, and I think it was Cadets, or maybe it was Blue Coats. I don't know, there, I remember there was some Andy Akiho, I think there was some John Sothis. That know? was Blue Coats, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. so what, like, what does John Sothis think of this being, I mean, a New Zealand classical composer, <laughs> yeah. like... I'm yeah. sure this world is completely foreign to him, and you know, it, like, but he seen. It seems like anyone would be very honored to have such, you know, an important organization for youth doing their music. Like, what does mm -hmm. a John Sothis think when you use their music in a show? Yeah, uh, backing up two seconds, just to agree with your student. Like, I learned who Shostakovich and Bartok were yeah. through drum corps. You know, like as a high school student. Yeah. So it, it it did. It was my foot in the door to learn how to be a professional musician. You know. Um, but anyway, so back to the John thing. So John's music first arrived in drum corps through the Boston Crusaders and through me. <laughs> so we were, it was 2009, and um, we we wanted to um, – we had this music that had this sort of an Arabic, Greek, I don't know, kind of feel. So I thought, hey, let's use some music by John. I can't, And I had already um, – that was one of the first contacts I had with him. And so I had emailed him, and he's like, we wanted to use his piece of view from Olympus. And he's like, sure, go do it. And we got the mechanical licenses, and he didn't really know what it was. But I sent him a video after the season. <laughs> and he's like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And Promethean Editions featured it in a newsletter afterwards. Um, and then 2010, we did his Planet Damnation, his Timpani Concerto. And then last year, when Blue Cuts did it, I, Tom Rarick, their arranger, he, he knew I had a relationship with John. And he was like, hey, so we're thinking about this. Doing, we're doing one study. Um, and obviously there's an electronic part to this. And he was like, do you think John would let us use like the samples in his electronic parts? I was like, ah, oh, let's see. And I just emailed him and CC'd Tom and John is such a cool guy. He was like, oh yeah, go ahead and use it. He sent him all his samples that he used in the electronic parts and then they incorporated it into their show. Um, so John's super open to this. And, and I think John's really open. I mean, obviously I hope to his works being arranged. <laughs> Granted that I have 11 of them. Um, but uh, who was it? Jude Traxler like arranged drum dances with a pianist, and they, like they like improvise on it or something. Um, and he, I remember him writing the John writing this post on it. Like it's so cool to see when a piece takes on new life in a way you could have never imagined. You know, so he John strikes me as very open to these kinds of things. And um, yeah, I have no idea. I can't imagine there are marching bands in New Zealand or anything of that nature. So I, 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 this has to all be a surprise to him of what drum corps is. Um, yeah, but I know another another name to mention in the same vein is John Mackey, who is not at all in that world. And John Mackey doesn't even play an instrument. And I've heard right. or seen things on Facebook about, yeah, groups have done his stuff. And yeah, he thinks it's cool. Yeah, he thinks it's cool. You know, even though, even though we have to chop it up and splice it and move things around, 
Um, and I told John right off the bat, I said, you got to realize we're not just doing the piece. It's going to be a very cut up. He's like, oh, yeah, it's fine. Do it. It's like, okay, I think cool. I think that's a very common opinion amongst composers. I'm very happy to, to see that. But I would just caution any any listeners, that, uh, especially young listeners, that uh, they may be laid back, but until you don't ask, then all yeah, of a there's there's, there's a business side of that. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, like it's cool because yeah, you know, it's cool because the business was taken care of. We got the licensing, we got the communication set up, we told them exactly what it was up front. It's the ones, that, yeah, I think you're, you know, it, at Glee, uh, not Glee clubs, um, who are the the uh, show choirs? They're like running into the same problem, right? They're just taking people's music and chopping it up and not telling anyone. Sure. And um, that's where we, you run into problems. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, th I think folks are, are really happy to see their stuff spread around and, and mm -hmm. transformed and used in different ways. But yeah, it's just often if you just ask, they'll, they'll say, yeah, of course. For, it was funny for me being the old guy in the audience and having no idea that I was about to hear. Uh, they did uh, Andy Akiho, No One to No One. That's right. No, that was Carolina Crown. That was a different drum corps. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, but like, yeah, they had the singer. The yeah, old guy in the audience that has no idea what's. I'm just going to support my one student that's in all of this. I'm like, <laughs> wait, I, like I know this tune. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't think anyone like... else around me knows it other than <laughs> what they've seen on YouTube of this. But like, I actually know this piece. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really cool to see the rep in drum corps getting like super progressive. You know, at the, at, at, all, it's traditional at, 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 on some respects, but it's also getting very progressive in that regard. And and Andy marched drum corps. I think he marched cadets, actually. Um, so he has a little bit of a background in it, too. Andy Akiho. Um, so th I think that's a cool little link, too, you know. What do you got, Megan? Well, I was just going to ask Omar. We're kind of nearing the end of the hour here, and I wanted sure. to kind of ask a question a little bit on a lighter note. Um, you know, you're someone that I've always looked to as a model of someone who can manage, you know, having a family and having a successful career as a performer, a teacher, and a ranger. And sometimes I wonder how you can do all of that. And I think you still have time to, like, have fun and do some things on your own. So I'm wondering if you could tell us, maybe not what your magic potion is, but what are some hobbies that you have? What are some things that you do for fun? Um, well, keep in mind that I, I'm not perfect. I, um, my, my, oh, son, my, 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 well, my son had the, um, had tryouts for the all-star team yesterday and I forgot. Oops. Yeah. And so I, I slip up on all sides of this, you know, and I, and, and it was because it just, things got busy and I forgot. And um, it was even after his baseball practice, like we went home <laughs> and today we we're at a baseball game and I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot to take him to the all-star tryouts. Um, so yeah, things slip up, you know, um, life's busy. We all mess up things. Um, but what was, your, what was your question again? <laughs> Okay, but yes. yes, but you commit to having a family. And yeah, yeah. Oh, what, what, what are things that do for fun? Commit to having a career. And then I feel like you also commit to, like, being a good person and having fun. And so what are some of your hobbies? Um, I run a lot. Um, not so much in the past month. I just got my, I had my first run in a month today. But before that, you know, I'd like, I, I run a marathon. I run a couple halves. Um, and that's uh, an activity I like because it's really my only time by myself. Um, when I'm not with my kids or not with students or whatever. Um, so I do that. Um, and then I try to spend an hour, two hours, maybe a night with my wife watching TV. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of fun. Um, I think that's, um, where it is. I, I, I try to, I try to channel all the fun into the family, you know, and make sure that when, whenever we, I have a moment, it's with them. Mm -hmm. uh, because that time is so precious and not, not to sound overly sappy about it, but you know, your kids really do grow up fast. And, yeah. uh, I mean, Megan, you'll appreciate this. I mean, Maya turned 10 last week Ooh. and, uh, uh, you know, my son turned eight in February and, um, you know, I mean, couple, what, six more years when Maya's driving. That's you crazy. I, fun fact. I was with Omar. I was, I was designated his chauffeur. We were coming back. We were in Orlando for drum yeah. work. And he was like, okay, I need you to drive. And I need I need you to drive to the camp this weekend. And I need you to be able ready to leave at, like, 30 seconds notice because. 
Nicole might burst. <laughs> very soon. Yes. And I just remember dropping you off, and Nicole was like in the parking lot, just like doing laps, <laughs> yeah. like get it out. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was that we got home that night, and Maya was born that evening. Yeah, like four. Yeah. Like, well, she went to labor that evening. She was born later the next day. But yeah, that's 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 a <laughs> that was a crazy. And then two weeks later was my interview at Furman. Yeah, that was crazy time. Yeah, definitely thought so that was... two weeks later was the next kid. I was very confused. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. my other wife, you know. <laughs> right. Well, you guys, this has been great. Thanks to everyone who submitted these these Facebook questions. Robbie Green, Brian Raddock, and Alex Ortega. I'm so sorry we didn't quite get to your question. But, yeah, we will uh, do our best to do that uh, in these episodes. So, Ben, Megan, Ryan, Laurel, and Omar Carmenetas, thanks so much. It's great to finally chat with you. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. Nice to, nice to hang, hang and spend some time with you all. Cool. Okay, everybody, we'll catch you at 1.45. See you later. All right, thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.